I think the first thing to say is happy birthday, Canberra, on the 100th anniversary. And uh, it's great to be here. Rolf and I met 40 years ago, uh, plus a couple of months in Canberra. We did the work that won the Nobel Prize here, the, the basic science the discovery that won it. And so we, we have an affection for Canberra that, that, that's considerable. And uh, uh, as was said, I am an, my expertise is in the area of immunity to viruses. And uh, I'm still working in that area. I'm not an expert on communication. Whatever I've learned about science communication is from having my head beaten around by smart journalists and uh, getting into trouble with the media and with the public. And uh, it's been an interesting ride. And I've also been writing trade books or lay books on science. And it's very nice of you to come and hear uh, from a guy who's written a book about chooks, actually. So uh, you all look much more sophisticated than that, quite frankly. Um, so. Uh, I'm talking about how, how one approaches science and what's available and, and how we actually find out what's real and what's not real. Uh, there's information out there, there's misinformation. Uh, many of the traditional ways we got information have changed. We're no longer relying so much on newspapers, we're relying on the internet. How do we make judgments? How do we make discrimination? It's as important for me as for you because even though I'm a scientist and reasonably well known, my expertise is, scientists know a great deal about very little, uh, a little bit more about a little bit, bit more, and, and then not a whole lot about a lot of other things. I mean, I'm no more an expert on, on climate change, for instance, than, than anyone else in the room who's never worked in science. Of course, there may be people in the room who are expert in that area. But these are important issues, and they're important to all of us. And all of us have to develop some sort of understanding and become sort of some sort of position on where we are with these issues, because they're major issues, both for the human present and for the human future. And that's my topic. And basically, I'm sort of using you in a way, because what I'm doing is I'm going to write a book on this. This is my next book. And uh, I, I want to see the feedback. So I put my email up there. It's pcd at unimel.edu.au. Uh, Program Cell Death PCD stands for. And um, uh, please, uh, if you've got a comment, no matter how, how hostile, please send it to me uh, because it may help me to be a better human being. Thank you. <laughs> now, the issue is, of course, that we're in an er era where there is a considerable dissatisfaction or distrust of authority. Uh, the days when there were great men who could make great statements and pontificate have gone. Uh, even great women have trouble, but uh, less, of course, because they're generally more reliable. And so who do we believe? And we distrust those sorts of statements. We distrust the statement from the medical professional, or many do. Uh, we distrust the statement from, from these authority figures. That, though, le leaves us open uh, if we don't have sufficient information, if we don't have the background, that leaves us open to manipulation by people who are really uh, kind of awful. And we are manipulated just in the same way as we're always manipulated by the advertising industry. I've never been quite convinced that things go better with Coke. And uh, really, um, there, there's a lot of quackery and nonsense out there. And this gains considerable traction in society, and we're all, all aware of that fact that it gains considerable traction. One of the areas, of course, that I think about a lot, and I'm not actually going to talk about tonight, is the, era, uh, is the area that people are not vaccinating their children. Now, that's a major issue. I'm not going to actually get into that. It's, uh, it's an area where I do have some, some credentials, but, uh, but I, I think I've talked about it before, and, and it gets a bit boring if I go on about it all the time. So the questions are, how do we access valid information? Who can we trust? And how do we search out valid information? And that's what I want to address. And I hope I won't be too tedious as I go through that, because many of you may be better informed on this than I do. I still don't have an iPhone, and I've never used an app, which means some of you may wish to leave the room immediately. <laughs> I said to Barry Jones the other day that if you were at a cocktail party and you wanted to have all the information that ever was, you had to have Barry Jones standing next to you. Uh, but now, all you need is an app on an iPhone. And actually, uh, Barry looked a bit taken back. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Big things are happening. We live on an increasingly challenged planet. As we all realize, through the 20th century, the numbers of human beings on the planet quadrupled. That's had very various effects. It's made us more susceptible to infections that are out there in wildlife. It's, uh, there's the problem of degradation and use of land. And, and there's, there's some difficult realities that we have to face. And we have to face them as realities. I, I worry that for some, particularly some young people, the realities are simply what we see on a screen. There are realities beyond what we see on a TV and a computer screen. Science can, the job of science is to try to define that reality. Scientists don't talk about truth. We talk about our best approximation to understanding the reality. And we know that most of the time, our, our perception of that reality, what we're saying, is going to have to be modified. But we, we try to make our best statement. And that's where science stands. If it's to work, it has to be supported from the public sector because the type of science that tells us about the natural world, the type of science that tells us about basic medical problems is done through public funding. We can't expect, for instance, drug companies to fund research unless it's going to give them some sort of product. We can't expect them to fund the basic understanding. And if it's to come from the public sector, then it has to be appreciated and valued within the public sector because we live in a democracy and democracies are responsive, we hope, to the, uh, to the wishes of the voters, at least at some level. So science and society have to talk to each other if we're going to have a successful scientific enterprise. Now, Here's a, a, a group of scientists, a group of old scientists actually, getting together at a Nobel symposium. There's a lot of things bagged Nobel. You get a lot of geriatric Nobel Prize winners together and they make some sort of pronouncement that's probably written for them by people who are still intellectually able. And um, <laughs> this was one in, uh, in Stockholm that I went to. So the king and, king and uh, the future queen of Stockholm, the princess, uh, uh, hosted it. And so we were constantly jumping up and down when kings and princesses and things walk in. The one before that was hosted by that great scientist, Prince Charles, at St. James Palace in London. And before that, it was at the Potsdam Institute in, uh, in Germany. It's actually a, 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 a program that's spearheaded by, the, by Johann Schollenhuber at the Potsdam Institute. Uh, he was the one that was uh, presented with a hangman's noose when he talked about climate change in Melbourne not so long back by the uh, uh, Linda LaRouche nutters. Uh, I hope there are no Linda LaRouche people in the world, in the room, but if so, do, do email me. And, um, and these are some of the issues that they identified. Planetary stewardship, global carbon challenge, equitable green economy, new social contract, new models for Earth system governments. Uh, humanity stands at a defining moment in Earth's history. All this is true, but how are we actually going to get any action on it? Once we talk about global governance, we get into really big problems. It's bad enough when we talk about the governance of Australia with our federal system, but global government governance is a really big issue. And uh, particularly when countries like the United States are extremely suspicious of, of uh, any sort of global uh, governance. Uh, I mean, you know, those militia groups in the middle of America believe there are black armed helicopters out there controlled by the UN. Actually, they're not black, black they're camouflaged. But, um, so, people matter, the earth matters. How do we deal with this sort of issue? René Dubos, who was a very wise man, a bacteriologist at the Rockefeller University, coined the statement, act locally, think globally. Think globally, act locally. René Dubos trained Frank Fenner. Frank uh, Fenner, who we were celebrating today with the 14th Fenner Symposium, great Canberra identity, first professor of microbiology here, uh, a director of the John Curtin School, and the founder of what was CRESS, the, the Environmental Institute on the grounds of the Australian National University. I don't know whether it's still called that. I think it's something different, isn't it? Um, uh, Frank uh, worked with Dubos. He Frank, during the war, was an expert on malaria. He, he did the malaria control work for the Australian Army, finished the war as a major and with an OBE, which is pretty extraordinary because he was quite young, and then uh, worked with McFarlane Burnett in Melbourne, worked with Dubos, and then was appointed to this job. Um, food. Food is an enormous issue for us. Uh, if climate change is real and, and we start to see increasing desertification, increasing unreliability of weather patterns, which 
may be happening. I mean, we have to be conservative about these things. Uh, increase in human numbers. We know we're draining water uh, from all over the planet. We're losing the water in the aquifers in India. They're losing water from the aquifers in the Middle East. We're getting into water shortage situations. We can get water from the oceans and desalination. Very expensive, very energy expensive. Um, grain prices have been shooting up because of biofuels and so forth. The switch to meat and biofuels, as the world becomes more prosperous, they want a type of lifestyle that we have, they want uh, more, more meat and so, so on. And so there's all these issues we have to balance and try to get a sustainable future. And, and that is the issue, of course. How do we have a sustainable future? Uh, energy is absolutely central. Obviously, if we could have unlimited free energy, we could do almost anything. And as you know, there's all sorts of proposals for doing this uh, through solar, wind, tides, waves, geothermal. None of these are a reality in terms of economic cost, which is why people talk about carbon taxes and, and all the rest of it. Uh, the real challenge, of course, is to bring those costs down. We talk a lot about algal biofuels, various things of that type. And, of course, nuclear fusion, the holy grail. Uh, nuclear fusion is, is a promising field. It's uh, in something maybe in 20 years uh, something will happen. They, uh, ever since I've heard about nuclear fusion, it's going to happen in 20 years, but it hasn't quite got there yet. But we have hopes. Um, so in, in, if you try to convey this, the, these, these concerns... You will have elements in society who will, who will back up against them. And because, that's because their financial interests will be threatened. We live in a capitalist system. If you threaten major players in that capitalist system insisting on change or insisting on a change that would actually make their product worthless or, or, or worth less, then you will be faced with, obviously, opposition because that's the way our system works. And the power, I don't think any of us can doubt the power of invented narrative. Invented narrative is, of course, what drives advertising. Most of it's non-toxic, some of it is toxic. But invented narrative is very powerful, and it's very powerful because it can confuse or it can actually offer an alternative that's not, not evidence-based. And, and the big question for us is how do we tell what is evidence-based and what is actually invented? Um, we have various institutes uh, institute is a kind of dubious term. There are real institutes. There are institutes like the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, which is a great research institute. You can tell whether an institute is a genuine research institute because by just looking it up. Look up who, what, what they publish, what they're, what they're writing about, where they're publishing. Are they disclosing their sources of funding? Do you know who pays the costs? If you look up something like the Water and Eliza Hall Institute, you'll find that it's paid by research uh, foundations and they have an endowment that people gift and all the rest of it. Some of these institutes, though, are simply pressure groups operating for, for powerful interests and, and basically uh, not disclosing. And this is what, it's, what we need to look for. If someone is legitimate and straight up, or if an institution is legitimate and straight up, it should disclose. It should disclose its conflict of interest. It should disclose where its funding comes from. If it will not do that, it's crap, and we can't listen to it, because they're basically concealing, and we can't have that. Um, oddly, uh, those who disparage science, or disparage, say, climate scientists, often justify their actions by arguing that everything will be solved by science. This is a favourite argument. It always amazes me because you see this enormous hostility to the people who are trying to tell them, hey, this might be happening. And then you see their argument which says, oh, we'll all solve it by science and technology. You, they want to back horses both ways. I mean, it's something to do with John Singleton and the Waterhouses. I'm not sure how it works. Um, environmentalists, it's not just the, what we perceive as the right that can be nutty about this or dishonest about it. It's also uh, on the left. I mean, the, you, you, there are some environmental groups, or most environmental groups, won't even discuss GM technology. If you talk to people individually, they say, oh, yes, we realise there's a real potential here. But if we go to our, our membership, the people that support us, they will, uh, they will be horrified. Uh, the, the same is true for people who are totally opposed to nuclear power. We have climate scientists like Barry Brook coming up, uh, and many in the United States saying, we've got to, in the short term at least, go to nuclear power for some situations. 
In the Northern Hemisphere, we certainly have to. And uh, I think Germany's thing to back off totally from coal is just not going to happen, quite frankly. So these are alternatives. and that, I'm not saying they're the alternatives we should embrace, but I'm saying the, they're the alternatives we have to discuss. And we have to discuss rationally. We have to be able to discuss them as a society. We have to have a societal discussion which is informed. I don't mind, if, it's not a problem if people are against something or they're for something, but it needs to be an informed discussion so far as is possible. And, that's, and that, I think, becomes even more interesting as we have all this communication that's possible through things like Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it. With the social media, the discussion that is possible is enormous, and, and having that discussion, an informed discussion, is going to be a really major thing for the future. We're obviously in a change at time of enormous transition and change. I think this has been a time of greater change than, a, it, than probably since the Industrial Revolution. And, and really, uh, we have to be, it offers the potential for a collective discussion in a way that's never been possible before. But we can't really contribute well to that discussion unless we're informed. And if we're not informed, unless we can demand that people provide us with this information. And we have to know what we need to know, if you wish. Um, so we need to deal with reality rather than myth, because that will dictate how we spend, how we spend our own money, and how we vote. And I think these issues are of central importance to the health of democracy. People are very concerned, I think, about the health of democratic systems. And if you watch some of the events in American election campaigns, particularly, you can see why. And also, with our election campaign, where the election process is, is really focused on particular areas where there are swinging votes. It may not be true in the next election, there may be no swinging votes, but, uh, but generally, it, it, that's the case. So if democracy is to work, we have to be informed. And we can't rely on that old stayer, st st the newspaper, because that's not really helping us all that much. Modern science, I, I don't have time to talk much about it. begins less than 500 years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it, you, you get the foundings of the various national academies, the Royal Society of London, the, the Academy of uh, the French Academy. Um, the basic rule is nothing by words alone. The actual philosophy of science is really set up by the English philosopher, statesman, Francis Bacon. Bacon said, knowledge is power. Of course, he's writing in Latin, so the word for knowledge is scientia, science. And, and he's, he actually uses science, or when you read the translation, he uses science. Nobody used the term scientist. There were no, no one used the term scientist until, I think, the late 19th century. Uh, there were natural philosophers and geologists and botanists and so forth. It, Bacon really laid out the rules for modern science. Interestingly, he said knowledge is power. He was, uh, he was James the uh, first uh, Chancellor of the uh, Lord High Chancellor, and you know he could have had his head chopped off at any time due to making a political mistake. But he thought knowledge is power. Um, accurate measurement, measure up and lower limits, accurately described, and that's translated in science, and it was soon translated by the people at the time, people like Robert Hooke and Newton and so forth, into saying that it has to be published. Not only do you do the work, you have to publish the work. You have to publish the work so it can be scrutinised. That's transformed, of course, into the work has to be peer-reviewed before it's published in a legitimate science journal. Uh, peer review, uh, there's a lot of discussion of peer review. Peer review does not say that the science is correct. What it says is that the people who read this science, the people who read the, the data, the arguments and so forth, believe that the arguments that are made are sufficiently justified by the data that's provided for it to go out for scrutiny. That's what peer review is. Now, it's more rigorous in some situations than others. Sometimes the peer review process can sometimes take a year or two years now. Uh, with some of the major journals, which are under great pressure. Uh, you will see papers that will come out that have uh, a, a, a traditional scientific paper and then 17 pieces of supplementary data online. It's a, it can be an extremely rigorous process or a not very rigorous process. But the real validation of science isn't in peer review. It's w in whether it can be repeated or whether the, the concepts and ideas and, and so forth that are put forward can be validated by some other mechanism. So that's why we have to have publication and validation. And until we have validation, then it's uh, not generally accepted. Bacon really made those arguments, 
and, and took us away from the old scholasticism where people just make pronouncements about things and pontificate and took us into an evidence-based world. And that's really the world that's so transformed society over the last 400 years or so and given us the society we had today. Of course, if uh, we stayed in that, that world of 1500, the natural world would be in much better shape because we die regularly, about 50% of the population would die regularly from big pandemics, we'd starve to death, we'd do all these things. And so if we wanted to go back to that world, we would have uh, uh, much less damage to the natural world. Of course, it's not possible. You can't go backwards in that sense. So hypothesis, measurement, observation. When scientists speak with authority, they, they, should, they must be backed up by data. You cannot have authority statements from scientists that are just out of the air. It, it's, it's, it, it, it makes that ridiculous. Where can we get, where can we in the community access decent information about science? Well, I would suggest to you we can from the National Academies of Science. What are the National Academies of Science? We hear about them. What are they? Well, they're basically groups of people, men and women, though still many more men than women, though we're trying to, to uh, address that balance, who are elected by members of that academy. So they, and they're elected on the basis of their scientific merit. And so you look at their research papers, you look at the impact of their research, they're elected to the fellowship. So that takes someone who looks like uh, 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 the sort of person that you would not want taking out your daughter to some sort of an establishment figure as they get older. Obviously, they tend to be older. They don't wear top hats, but I just thought that was, that was a very establishment sort of picture. Uh, they are established people. And so they're older. The, the academies are conservative. And they, they prepare a lot of reports. Uh, the, the major academies that prepare reports that we would want to access are the Royal Society of London, which is the National Academy of Science for Britain and for the British Commonwealth. Um, the, 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 the National Academy of Sciences is in the USA, which has a very big operation in this area. And also our Australian Academy does a pretty good job. Uh, what you will see with Academy reports is that they, if they issue a re-report, you will see that there will be changes. Uh, the, the things are not rigid. Um, the members of the academy who write these reports or the people they, they, they recruit to help with the reports, they're not always academy members, also always do so on an unpaid basis. There's no personal profit. It's all volunteer. And they actually pay uh, membership to be in the academy. So they're generally pretty reliable if somewhat conservative uh, types of documents. And some of them are truly excellent. Um, this is the Royal Society of London building. That building is von Ribbentrop's Nazi embassy. Uh, after the war, the Nazis didn't need an embassy in London after 1945. Howard Florey, the Australian, who had just won the Nobel Prize for penicillin in 1945, or shared the Nobel Prize in 1945, was at that stage president of the Royal Society. Uh, and he conned the uh, British government into buying this building, which is right on the Mall. And so you can watch all the processions and things going up and down there. It's a fascinating building. It's actually got a stairway, a spiral stairway, stairway that was designed by Speer, Hitler's architect. And uh, uh, this is, of course, our own National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Mark Oliphant uh, was the first, uh, first president. And it, it kind of formed as a subsection of the, National Acad of the Royal Society. Uh, we have another academy, the Australian Academy of Technological and Sciences and Engineering which is more to do with downstream. And when I'm talking about science, I'm talking just about, as much about engineering. I, I'm not discriminating between the two, two at all. They, they are somewhat different functions at times, but of course they obviously share a common space. Uh, the Royal Society actually has the, has the functions of our Academy of Technology and our Academy of Science in the one body. I, I think it may not have been the best thing to do to make them separate in Australia. It might have been better if they had been set up together, but that's the way it is. And the various academies all get together and, uh, and, and, uh, and work together on various issues. So, so it's not such a barrier. There's also an Academy of Social Sciences. Um, the US National Academy of Science was set up specifically by President Lincoln in 1863 to advise government. At the time of the Civil War, he set up the National Academy of Science because already it was obvious that science was driving the way war was conducted and they would need science for the rebuilding phase afterwards. Scientists have always made a, a contribution to war. In fact, early scientists like Descartes and so forth were military scientists. That's why they often learn a lot of their living. 
Um, the National Academy is the most sophisticated when it comes to public information. It was set up by uh, Lincoln to do that, and it has various subsets, the National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine. People are elected to these separately. You can be a member of the Institute of Medicine but not be a member of the National Academy of Sciences. They put out excellent reports and, uh, and to government that are broadly available. All these academy reports are available free. They're online. You can download them. You can read them uh, and see what they actually say. And so, uh, again, a very good uh, uh, source of information. Uh, this is Albert Einstein's statue in the, in the grounds of the National Academy. I think Einstein's one of the few scientists that people actually recognise. Um, the other thing is that uh, a lot of information is now becoming available for open access. The Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is a pretty prestigious journal, for example, is now available so that any article that's been published for six months is available for anyone to read. Uh, and, and download from the, from the internet. You can get it, it doesn't cost you anything, and, and there's a lot of other good information out there that you can do that with. Now, you might think, if you're reading a scientific paper and so forth, you won't really get it. Well, you may not get it at one level, but I think we're all accustomed to the fact that we read things at different levels, and, and I think you can get something from it. You can get an idea of what it's about. Even if it's only from the abstract, you can get an idea from what it's about. And you can, you can maybe form an assessment of how valid you think it is. Of course, you can't really assess it in the sense that a real professional working in that area would assess it, but you can get some perception of it. Uh, popular science magazines, there's a number of them. There are two Australian ones, there's Australasian Science and Cosmos. Cosmos is uh, uh, sponsored and run by Alan and Ella Finkel. We're in the Finkel Lectureship, which was endowed by, by the Finkels. Ella is a professional journalist. Uh, um, Alan was, is a, a science entrepreneur and businessman and very committed. Um, Nash, Australian Geographic has good science stuff in it. The Australian Skeptic has stuff. That's available free online. Uh, a lot of these things, though, you have to pay to actually get access to them. And uh, what we're trying to work out now globally is really open access so that anyone can read anything in science. And uh, the US National Institutes of Health which is the big funding agency for medical research in the United States, something more than $30 billion a year in medical research funding, is insisting that within, the, I think it's a year or two years, that all papers published under NIH research funding be available for open access. And so we've had this whole open access model. Uh, how is it going to work? I mean, the journals and the, and the people who pay the editors and so forth have to be paid. So how are we going to do this? Uh, the basic model is the scientists pay up front when they submit their papers, and that's the charge. And so it can be quite a bit. I mean, to publish your open access article in Nature, which is the top science journal, along with Science, the American journal, you, you have to pay something like 5,000 bucks up front. Sounds like a lot of money, but in actual fact, um, your, your research has probably cost at least 100,000, maybe $200,000, and the product is the publication. And so initially at least, I mean it may have other implications later. So that's not really as bad as it sounds. But once that's paid, that means that that article is available for anyone to read. And th that's the way it's going. There's also a whole lot of public, uh, public li access formats, particularly in the medical sciences. There's the Public Library of Science, which are medical journals, BMC, that's Biomed uh, Central, Frontiers is somewhat uh, broader. There's a whole lot of them and they're increasing in number all the time. So public access to science is now a reality if people care to make use of it. Um, also, all science now is dependent on bigger and bigger data sets. We're generating massive data sets in biomedical research through what we call the systems biology approaches, the omics, genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, whatever. These are massive data sets. And we're, we, for instance, are generating them in our US lab in association with a group in, in Seattle, at Seattle Biomed, uh, called, uh, uh, led by a guy called Alan Adaram. And all those data sets, they're all about influenza infection, uh, with v comparing virulent and less virulent influenza viruses, 
all those data sets are going immediately online. The same is true of a lot of the climate science data sets, meteorology data sets. There's some limitations here if bureaus of meteorology have some sort of commercial interest in actually selling the information. But more and more, people are trying to put all this data online. The, the meteorology people who uh, provide the data that's largely used, say, by the climate science, but collect that data for tidal and uh, ocean current uh, uh, predictions, uh, weather forecasts and all the rest of it, are getting enormous amounts of data from things like uh, satellites, all sorts of buoys and so forth. Uh, environmental watch organisations, uh, CSIRO for instance, is monitoring for invasive species in our forests by flying small drones over them and, uh, and photographing what's below. Uh, drones are going to become a big feature of a lot of environmental uh, uh, monitoring type research. All this is, is data and all that data has to be handled and really one of the big challenges for us is to have enough computing and enough power and enough mathematically and statistically trained people who are actually able to handle this data. So if you're young and you want to get a job and you're mathematically competent, uh, think about building up your mathematical skills, your statistical skills, because everything from environmental science to banking to insurance wants these skills, and they're all dealing with bigger and bigger and more, uh, more perceptive and detailed data sets. Um, I've been through that. Uh, Open access uh, to those data sets, um, US National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, for example, the NOAA, it's the one that looks at all the climate things, it has the National Climate da Data Center, all that sort of thing, it monitors what's happening with the Arctic, puts out regular reports for people like me to read because obviously I can't really evaluate this data at first hand. Uh, all their raw data is now going online. They also put out the algorithms that they, they use to deal with these and they publish those algorithms in peer-reviewed journals. Now this is all great because it means those data sets are available to anyone to access. So if someone wants to say uh, the climate scientists are lying to us, it's really up to them to go ahead, analyse that data, reanalyse it in their own way and then put out their peer-reviewed publication with their algorithms clearly stated so we know exactly what they're doing. It's so anyone can do it. It doesn't matter who you are. It's there. If you can, you can access it, you can do it. And if they're going to say this is wrong or they've misinterpreted, then it's up to the person who's saying that to really get that and do it. Now, the only concern about that is that we have seen, and we've seen it on Australian television, I won't mention the guy because he's quite litigious, but we've actually seen people who, who do that but do it from the, as, from the aspect of trying to create confusion. And, and that's what we have to watch about. Uh, if, if people are going to do that sort of analysis off their own bat, they really have to publish it in some way and publish the algorithms that they're using. Otherwise, it can be, uh, can be very counterproductive. It's great, though, to get the information out of the academy. I guess, that, and, and I think what we're going to see is all sorts of people coming into various problems. And we've actually seen some situations where people have gone out and put out a problem and said, look, anyone in the world should look at this and get back to us because, and I think there's one, I, I think it was a structural problem that was solved by people who do normally write computer games and stuff. So maybe it'll be people who write chess games or, or people who cheated racing or something will actually do the stuff. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting time and, uh, and that's the Chinese curse, isn't it? Um, so may you live in interesting times. Um, fraud, fraud happens in science. And it happens much more than we'd like. It happens particularly in the medical sciences. It happens particularly where people are very driven, where they're in high-profile institutions and they're really very competitive. And it's, it's, uh, it, it, it usually gets blown. If it's important, it always comes out that it's wrong because people try and replicate the experiments and they can't do it. So it may just fade away. The, the case I know best, because I've talked at length to someone who was actually in the lab at the time, was a case where someone was faking and the people in the lab realised he was faking and they blew him right away. They, 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 they first went to see the university administration, then they went to see him and they charged him with it and he eventually broke down and said, yeah, I faked, I've been faking for years. And uh, he, he didn't go to prison, but others have gone to prison. If you fake in the United States, if you commit fraud with federally funds, federal funds, you can go to prison. The Attorney General will go... The, um, I think it's the Attorney General's office or whatever the equivalent is will go after you or the FBI may go after you and some people have gone to prison. 
And so uh, you just can't do that. Uh, um, my uh, colleague in the US, after he, we discussed all this, we'd been discussing with the lab, he asked the people in the lab and said, if, I f if you found out I was faking, what, you would, what would you do? And they said, we'd expose you immediately. And they all smiled. And so uh, I think you should ask, the, if you're a scientist in the audience, ask the people in your lab what they would do if they found you were committing fraud. And I think you may get an interesting response. Um, fraud, uh, I think it's much harder to commit fraud with large, complex data sets because there are too many people involved. And I don't think you can get away with it. And I, I don't think it, I doubt if it's happening. It, what can happen is you can get it wrong. The interpretation can be wrong. You may not have the right uh, algorithm or something like that. So, so people can get it wrong, which is why it's good to have them out there. Um, the conservatives uh, in the US, for instance, tried very hard to discredit the Michael Mann hockey stick, which was basically a temperature rise uh, thing uh, uh, generated from uh, correlating CO2 and temperature rise generated from looking at tree rings. You know, the, the temperature records don't go back very far. Um, it wasn't. They found there was some, some they could have used, he could have used better statistical methods, but they, when they reanalyzed it actually came out much the same. And now there's another lot of other measurements from different systems like ice cores and going into ocean life that's been down there for a long time that give you the same sort of, uh, same sort of pattern. So, uh, so um, it, it is, I think, hard to, to be fraudulent there. Books on science, uh, there are a lot of books on science, uh, some good, some bad. Um, of course, as soon as uh, anyone publishes a book, they lo lose all sense of judgment and credibility, and uh, you, you shouldn't believe them at all. And, uh, uh, but there are some, some pretty good science books around. And, but I would suggest to you that if you read a book on science uh, and you're, you're, it appeals to you, do look up the author and see who he is and what he does. A lot of very good books are written by... Um, by uh, uh, journalists, I mean, or, or professional writers. Um, you know, obviously, Bill Bryson, uh, various other people. There's a great book on, the best book on flu is by, uh, by a guy called John Barry, who's, who's, not, a, who's not a scientist. Um, journalists can sometimes, I think, emphasise dramatic effect over, over the actual facts, but, you know, they want to sell their book. Um, read the reviews. If, if a book is controversial or if, if you're worried at all about it, read the reviews. Also look at the book. I think one of the things that you can pick up in a book, and I don't think you need science training to do this, you can pick up whether the guy's cherry picking, whether he's assembling his arguments to suit his case. We don't do that in science. We, we have to take the data and make our case from what we, what we find. It, we can't just take this bit of data and that bit of data and that bit of data and put it together to make a story that just happens to suit us. That's not the way it works. And if, if someone writing a book does that, it can be uh, pretty appalling. Um, look at their expertise. Do they really have that expertise? If the guy's actually uh, claiming to be an expert on uh, climate science, but his expertise is in rocks. I mean, do you really believe him? I mean, he has some insights into that. But I, I'm not a climate scientist, but I have some insights into biology. There's a lot of results from biology that are just as legitimate to the interpretation of climate effects as, as studies of rocks in geological time. And so uh, it's not really legitimate to do that. You need to put yourself out there and state your conflict of interest very clearly. You can look up any medical scientist on the PubMed database. You can look me up. You can see what I've published. Uh, you'll see if uh, you've got the wrong guy. There is a guy with my initials that doesn't publish on infection and immunity, he publishes on sex on rats. I'm not an expert on sex in rats, and I would never make any claims about it. Um, so, or sex in general, quite frankly. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> viruses, viruses don't have sex. I mean, you know, it's, not, it's not their thing. Um, uh, if you can get to a university library, you can look anyone up on the ISI of science, uh, science database, ISI Web of Science. Everyone's on that not just the medical scientists who are on PubMed. Uh, you can look them up, you can see what they've published, where they've published it, who's refer referenced them, and how, how much they're referenced. Uh, I won't go on with this. Uh, you can get much, I don't have time, um, but um, basically uh, uh, you, can, you can get some of the same information from Google Scholar, which is open. Anyone can go to Google Scholar, you can put a name in there, and you can get out all the results and so forth. Of course, if you put my name in as Peter Doherty, you'll get Pete Doherty, the drug-addicted rock star who has... Uh, but that's not me. Um, so, <laughs> Scepticism and denial. 
Um, skepticism is central to science. We're all skeptics. This guy's a real skeptic. You know, he's taking both points of view and one on each hand. And um, I think the difference between a skeptic and a denier is a, a genuine skeptic, and I'm highly skeptical, and you should be most skeptical about your own data, is that the denier is rigid. The skeptic is looking for the science just as the guy who's working on it is looking for the science. And the skeptic will modify his or her position as new insights come in. If someone is totally rigid, if they never modify their position, regard them with great suspicion. Uh, you should be adjusting your position as more information comes in. Um, it's a problem. I mean, some people get caught in denialism, I think. They become trapped by powerful interests who embrace them. Uh, that happened, I think, in the AIDS area. Uh, we had this, the guy Peter Duisberg, member of the National Academy of Science, very respected scientist, who insisted that HIV wasn't causing AIDS. Uh, it quickly became apparent that it does, but he stuck with that and stuck with it and stuck with it, despite all the evidence. And he had persuaded the president of South Africa to take steps which, uh, which operated in denial of that and actually resulted probably in hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of deaths. And so be very sceptical about uh, people who take those sorts of positions. There's also a problem with older scientists, and I've called it here the deficit in being paid attention to disorder syndrome, the dad syndrome. I don't want to be disrespectful of older scientists. I'm an old age pensioner myself. But uh, basically, it is uh, something that older scientists have to, have to watch out for, just like old guys. You know, these, guys, these young guys are all wrong, I'm in my day, that sort of thing. And, and that actually does happen in science, and sometimes quite eminent scientists can go down that road. And it's kind of sad to watch, and I've seen it happen uh, to people in my own field and to other fields, and, uh, and, and you worry about it. Um, it's a great time in many ways. Never before has so much great information been available. It's on Wikipedia, it's in all sorts of places. Uh, but you have to be able to tell what the good information is. Uh, in general, where I've looked at Wikipedia in a field I know, the information has been terrific. And in a field I don't know, I've often appreciated the fact they have little animations and stuff. Animation is a great way to convey uh, difficult scientific concepts. If you want some entertainment, look up Oil Conservapedia. Uh, that, will, that will amaze you, uh, and uh, I won't tell you about it, but look it up, okay? Uh, there's a lot of misinformation on the web as well, um, and, 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 and really you have to be careful of it. You have to be careful that it's not some dubious commercial interest that's putting it out there, and, and, uh, and so on. And of course, we're, we, I guess we're kind of aware of that, but be sceptical. Print media, newspapers are in trouble, as we all know. They're suffering from lack of revenue, particularly lack of re advertising revenue. Science stories generate no advertising revenue. Anti-science can generate advertising revenue. Yeah, uh, quack medicines, so the people will like to advertise there, uh, spread disinformation about climate science. You'll have some powerful friends in Australia. So, so remember, uh, I think in newspapers you have to look at them with, with some scepticism. Um, some of the good newspapers have gone. Times Picayune has gone from, uh, from New Orleans. Uh, Louisiana is probably the most corrupt state in the Union. And so if you don't have a good newspaper with good investigative journalists, you really lost something in that situation. And I'm really worried about the fact we're losing investigative journalists. It's not that the journalists that are out there and still there aren't good and aren't trying their best. And I, and I personally always try to talk to them if they call. I try to point them towards people who can really give them information. Uh, and, and, and a lot of them are working very hard, but there just aren't enough of them. And a lot of them are not very senior. They're really quite junior. Journalists do operate under a code of ethics. What they've been replaced by is opinion writers. Opinion writers operate under no code of ethics. They just write opinion. They can write lies. They do write lies. Distinguish between opinion and journalism. It's a totally different ball game. You're getting opinion from me at the moment, actually. Um, so, but I really worry. I mean, you know, Clark Kent, uh, he would lip, zip into a telephone box and change into his Superman outfit. The guy couldn't find a telephone box if he tried. And, and you know, uh, basically, he probably lost his job anyway. So uh, that's only for the older people. No one else knows who Clark Kent, my man, a reporter, actually is. Uh, New York Times, we can read it online. The Guardian, we can read online. There's now Guardian Australia. Look at the conversation. Um, it's, a, it's an academic, it's academics writing for a website. It's sponsored by the Australian universities. The conversation.edu.au. It's, it's very informative and it's free. If you go into it, 
uh, look up that, uh, that, that link. If you go into it, you'll get what looks like a newspaper. Put your, some, something that says to identify yourself or something on the page, put your email in and you'll get the daily update. It's free to read. Uh, the articles are by academics, but they go through a professional newsroom with professional journalists who write them so that normal human beings can actually read them. And they're very readable, informative, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, who cares? And you can comment on them. If you really hate them, you can send a comment and say, I really hate this article and why? And so you can have some fun with it if you've got some time. But do look at the conversation. It's a new model for communication that's drawing on the expertise that's in our universities. A, a similar operation is now starting up in the UK and we're hoping to see it start in the USA as well. We live in a time of massive change that allows us to tap enormous talent. I won't speculate on that. I think citizen science is coming back. There's a lot of interest in citizen science. In the 19th century and before that, a lot of the science is done by ordinary people who paid their own costs and all the rest of it. There was no scientific establishment, if you like. Um, and there were very uh, major things done by people like that. Uh, citizen science is coming back now, and it's coming back in things like bird watching, climate, earth watch, climate watch, and all the rest of it. And what's essential there is that you have a link between the observers, the, the people who are out in the field who are looking at birds or bees or butterflies or what rivers are doing and how polluted they are, and, and, and a link between them and the scientists so that they're, they're working in properly designed studies, studies and reporting their data back uh, to a proper observational system. Unless you have a well-designed study, you will actually have a lot of data that's useless. But that's working between various organisations like BirdLife Australia and the Watchers. The Citizen Science book there is put together by the eBird people at Columbia University who, who correlate all the stuff uh, that the American Audubon Society volunteers actually uh, accumulate. Now, I think I'm going hopelessly over time. How am I, Mr Chairman? You're getting pretty close to time. <laughs> is it 6.30 is time? Or? Uh, I think well, it'll Questions. It was actually 6.15. Oh, right, okay. Okay, so here we are. It's uh, Charles Dickens' has it. This is a wonderful time we live in. It's an extraordinarily exciting time, but we have to make it really work properly. And that's, uh, we're all familiar with Dickens. Uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, from a tale of two cities. We've come a long way since the French Revolution, so we've got something right. Um, the guillotine's not used. Uh, Lavoisier was actually a scientist, and he, had it, he, he got it in the neck. Uh, Sydney Carton was fictional. And there I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, because of uh, finishing on time, there are some time for there is some time for questions. So I we are two together there with their hands up. That's right. Failed to predict the earthquake, and subsequently they've been jailed for six years. That's kind of frightening. Um, sure. And I, I, I use that as an example, and I'm actually going to put it in the book because what the implication of that is, if we have, say, a climate catastrophe in the future, and the climate scientists have failed to warn society, uh, what is their, their liability? I, I think that's a major question. And um, it, it, uh, it means, really, when you think about it, if, if a scientist, whether they're publicly funded or whoever they are, if they perceive, perceive a major threat from the natural sphere, and even though their, their bosses may not want them to report on that, are they actually liable in the, in the future in terms... I think we need a whole uh, spectrum of... I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I want to talk... To, I, I'm, after I've got the next two books finished, I want, to, I want to talk to the lawyers and see what, whether there should be a body of future law that addresses the possibility that what we're doing now may constitute, in the long term, an appalling crime against humanity's future. Okay. So what would have happened, for instance, if in 1930 we'd had such statutes readily available and people were aware of them? I don't, I don't think any of us want to be what's called the good Germans. You know, the, the good Germans were the people who sat there while Hitler was sending people to the gas chambers and all the rest of it, and they didn't do anything or they didn't say anything. Oh, we really didn't know, or people weren't really, weren't really telling us. We don't want to be the good Germans. And, and I think uh, 
if we're not going to be the good Germans, we need to be informed and we need to take interest. Yeah. You can't really, I mean, replication of research, just simply replicating. The, the person who first publishes it, if they're a good scientist, they will replicate their, their data. Uh, what we will often find is the particular study itself is not replicated, but the, the concept that will come from it will be uh, addressed from other types of approaches. It, it's a difficult issue because, for instance, say it's an experiment that involved a set of experiments that involved a thousand mice. Now, you have to get ethical approval before you do studies with mice. And so can you use another thousand mice simply to replicate? You would have to be adding, in a sense. So it's, it's again, there's a lot of issues in science which really require interfaces between scientists and and, and, and people who are in the law, I mean, often people who are, have a religious background are useful. And, and we do that to some extent through our various ethics committees, human subject committees, animal ethics committees. They're really quite rigorous and they have broad representation. Sometimes people are quite hostile to the activity in question. But the actual question of simple replication can be problematic. Also, there's a difficulty with a lot of very modern science with very high technology equipment and very complex systems that they can often be extraordinarily difficult to actually replicate and to get all the tricks and so forth. So it, it's a difficult area at the moment, and you're right to identify it as a problem uh, and as something we really have to, to work our way through to validation. But, but major results do come through, and they do get validated. A lot of other things sort of slip by the wayside. It's important not to become too dogmatic about anything uh, that comes up quickly and, and to allow it time to mature. That's why it often takes 20 years or more before they award Nobel Prizes. We have a question right at the back. Yeah, John. It's really a, a difficult area. I've, I've sort of moved around in my life. I've lived in in the US on two separate occasions, the UK here, two separate, three separate occasions. Um, uh, and I've actually given up tenured jobs to take non-tenured ones uh, so that I could do the science that I wanted to do. But it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of young scientists and academics, this short-term contract thing. And we all agonise about it. Um, I know uh, the people in the funding agencies agonise about it. How can we ensure decent career structures? And, and it's tough and, uh, and it's likely going to get tougher in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I know some of our young uh, PhD graduates who are very smart, very good, are looking at this and they're saying, uh, we're not going to do it. And so we've had two very good young PhD graduates who've done extremely good research uh, are going into high school teaching. Now, I think, personally, that's, that's pretty good that, um, that because high school teaching is very, very important, as is primary school teaching. And so they're happy to do that and they've got the right personalities to do it. We've also had, of course, a lot of people go from sciences into uh, things like uh, uh, banking and all the rest of it. In fact, there is an argument that the global financial collapse was caused by physicists who went into the Wall Street banks and nobody knew what the hell they were doing because physicists are awfully smart and bankers maybe not quite so smart. Yes. So, one final question. Uh, in one of your earlier slides, you talked about the long, slow death of um, and you're not a philosopher, right? It's, it's not a problem here, but yeah. in society at large, if you look at newspapers, it seems to be alive and kicking. How can we yeah. help that along? How do we kill it? I don't know. I, I bet it, it, the more we can kill it, the better. Whenever you see it, jump on it and, uh, and try to squash it. It's uh, nicely, of course. But uh, uh, um, it's, um, it's the, the, the authoritarian statement. I think on a whole, the authoritarian statements have become less less powerful. But I think the scholasticism continues essentially in this invented narrative stuff. Uh, the people just make it up as they go along and they come up with sets of conclusions. And of course sometimes from the philosophical end that, that, does, uh, that does impact and uh, it is difficult. There, there is, um, I think there is a problem between the arts and the sciences in some senses uh, because of this.
Uh, and we have a lot of well-educated people, well-educated in the arts sense, or even in the, in the sort of partial science sense, who are rejecting vaccination and so forth and, and are really not susceptible to the arguments from science. So, uh, again, a difficult issue. One is hoping that, uh, that going to better information might help them, but I'm not sure. We tend to believe what we want to believe, don't we?